Who here isn't a fan of crossover comics? If you ask us, we are complete suckers for it. But any time a crossover has featured the dreadful slavering xenomorphs, our excitement level has somehow just doubled up. So one can only imagine our degree of enthusiasm when we heard that the celebrated duo of Jonathan Hickman and Isad Ribic are joining hands together to present to us the OG face-off. With the xenomorphs having reached Earth, yes, you heard that part right, we are looking at an epic battle taking place between the aliens and the Avengers. Are you ready to witness who will be the first to fall? Well, without further ado, let's get on to exploring the first issue of the ongoing four-issue crossover comic book series, Aliens vs. Avengers. But before we get into our explanation, we do have one very small request. If you enjoy our content, then please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Now, let's begin. The Beginning of the End, or The End of the Beginning. The first chapter begins with a distant view of a star system, and the very next comic panel gives the readers a slow pan in on a Shi'ar spaceship in the deep reaches of space. Two Shi'ar scientists are heard lamenting on their failed experiment in the backdrop, and it is only when we get a proper look at them and their experiment do we realize that they have xenomorphs in their possession, which they are making use of to conduct experiments on various alien races, all in the hopes of creating new strains of monstrous creatures. With one of the Shi'ar scientists telling the other that he really thought a Kree specimen would have shown more resilience and not fail post-implantation, we find a tortured and tied-up Kree prisoner or should we say, the aftermath of the torture to be more precise. The other Shi'ar scientist tells his colleague not to cry over spilt milk and reminds him that it is always two steps forward for each step back, further citing that while some would call the whole thing progress, they have a better name for it, and that is destiny. Through their conversation, we also learn that four out of five of their attempts have been a success with special mention of the Strontian, Dabari, and Katati having produced a successful strain, and add to this the Skrull specimen being the real prize pig of the entire lot. This is quite a strong indication that the Shi'ar scientists have their very sights set on the universe as a whole. Their discussion is cut short by the alarming sound of alerts, and the scientists get notified about four Explorer-class frigates of Wakandan design on an attack vector. The space-faring Wakandans very quickly end up destroying the Shi'ar's defense batteries, and it becomes pretty apparent that the Wakandans have arrived there to thwart the nefarious plans of the Shi'ar scientists. We finally get a good look at King T'Challa, his son Prince Azari, and the Hatut Zaraze, the latter being elite fighters. It's via Azari that we learn that the black hole below them is massive enough to cause severe time dilation, and that hours are equivalent to years. Of course, this is a high cost, but they have already quarantined an entire sovereign Wakandan world, particularly because of some weapons that they have traced back to their current location. Azari also states that the Wakandans are dying and therefore they will risk whatever they have to in order to put an end to the threat once and for all. All of a sudden, three xenomorph drones are seen preparing themselves to attack the Wakandans. This has Azari stepping forward and single-handedly taking down the creatures by unleashing powerful bolts of lightning on them. The Hatut Zaraze are given further instructions to locate the masters of the research facility and bring them on their knees to T'Challa. With the Hatut Zaraze able to find one of the Shi'ar scientists, he is brought in front of T'Challa. Apparently, the scientist was purging their systems, but the Hatut Zaraze were able to capture some of the data. It becomes obvious that the same weapon that was used on the Wakandan intergalactic empire has now already been launched in varied numbers in different worlds and that the worlds have to be secured at all costs. However, given the severe time dilation caused by the black hole, chances of saving those worlds look pretty bleak. Upon learning that one of the targeted worlds that the weapon was sent to was Earth, a highly appalled T'Challa looks at the Shi'ar scientist and asks him what kind of a monster is he, only to realize very quickly that the latter isn't really a member of the Shi'ar race, given that he lacks the basic defining traits of the living. Eventually, the one posing as a Shi'ar scientist turns out to be a synthetic, and with the android taunting at T'Challa, King T'Challa promptly draws a sword and decapitates the android's head. Before leaving, T'Challa also commands that the head be brought along with them. Aboard the warship, Azari informs his father that while they are still pulling data from the android's memory core, they have been able to establish that the weapon has already been sent to Earth, Chandelar, Spartax, and every other galactic hub that are out there. Naturally, this freaks out Azari, and he looks at his father. T'Challa admits to his son that the monsters are over the walls, the gates are flung open, and further stresses now that their great city has fallen, the only thing left to do is to survive. World at Peril over the course of several pages, we learn that the seed worlds were not chosen at random. 
Once a world is chosen for the host, the process, regardless of whatever world it is, remains the same. Now each sent seed probe carried four alien queen eggs inside, along with 12 infected hosts in suspended animation. Initially, four locations in proximity of high-density population centers were targeted for the final infestation. Now, given that the hosts were already placed into suspended animation on the precipice of a life cycle transition, it takes almost no time for a host to yield their hidden bounty, or in other words, the nightmarish xenomorphs. So, it is fitting to state that just within an hour, the xenomorph drones born from the chest bursters are fully developed, and within a day, a hive has already been constructed so that the life cycle of an alien queen can take place. The queen is eventually born and starts producing eggs after which the whole process inevitably speeds up. Hickman and Ribbick's setup of the attack on Earth is highly praiseworthy given the duo's attention to detail on the resolute plan of the xenomorphs to overrun the planet. Everywhere from Adelan to Atlantis is shown to succumb to the xenomorphs morph horde. It became pretty clear that extinction was largely at hand for every life on Earth. So much so, the mutants of Krakoa deserted their island home and resorted to their gateways to seek refuge on Mars. The only mutant left to battle the invading xenomorphs was Apocalypse, but even the mighty Apocalypse did not stand a chance. Has Earth already fallen before the xenomorph horde? Left in the wreckage is the last human city that has whoever is remaining of the Avengers in charge of the city's protection. We find an aged Carol Danvers arriving to meet an equally aged Bruce Banner, and this is where we get an insight into the current status of some of the superheroes. To begin with, three of the main Fantastic Four members Reed Richards, Susan and Johnny are dead. To top things, Ben Grimm and Franklin have disappeared. If you ask us, we think they are probably out somewhere given that there is a mention of a certain accident having taken place. So, we are guessing they will definitely return in the comic series, but when they will, surely happens to be a question mark right now. Now. Banner mentions about Valeria Richards still being out there somewhere and that he is expecting her, to which Carol urges Banner not to lose hope and toughen up. All of a sudden they hear an alert, and with Danvers telling Banner that Valeria is on her way there and that she is being chased by xenomorphs, Banner transforms into the Hulk and jumps right out of the building to go looking for Valeria. While we do find Miles Morales already in the scene, he is joined by the rampaging Hulk. They find Valeria, now in her mid-40s, driving a vehicle and pursued by the ravaging xenomorphs, and just when Valeria thinks that she will not be able to make it, Miles grabs hold of her literally at the last minute. Hulk is seen smashing the xenomorph and simultaneously asking Valeria for an explanation as to why she is late. Valeria tells him that things got a bit complicated and eventually apologizes, with Miles stating to the duo that he will not be able to hold the remaining xenomorphs any longer, they decide to leave from there with the alien egg that Valeria had somehow managed to steal from a hive earlier. A glimmer of hope? Afterwards, Valeria tells the trio of Banner, Miles, and Carol that if there happens to be even the slightest hope of winning against the perfect killing machines, she has finally found a way to do it. Valeria states to the group her plans of creating a virus, one that will kill the very eggs in the first place. This obviously has Banner asking Valeria if she should actually be creating a virus that has the possibility of mutating into something that is worse than their current predicament. With Carol pointing out to Banner that there is literally nothing that can be worse than what they are dealing with, Banner comes on board with the plan. Sometime later, we find Banner in the middle of a conversation with the elderly Peter Wayland, and both are hopeful that Valeria will be able to perform a miracle. Post the duo's brief conversation with each other, we find Banner going to see Valeria at the lab, having brought for her something to eat. When Valeria does not answer the door, Banner tries to get access inside, but he is denied entry. To Banner's utter horror, a hologram of Valeria appears instead, and it tells him that if he is seeing the recording, it is obvious that things are a little too late, and that he should not be opening the door at any cost. We along with Banner learn that Valeria had used a light bender based on her mother's powers, walked inside a hive, isolated and grabbed an egg. After this, she was slowly backing out but she tripped while doing so and got infected in the process. Aware of the grim fact that she will run out of time soon, she swore to find a way to kill all the xenomorphs but died before being able to complete her mission. Valeria's hologram urges Banner not to open the lab door so that the xenomorph can be kept contained inside, but we all know Banner at the end of the day. He has already transformed into the Hulk by then, and as he tears his way inside the laboratory, the lurking xenomorph lunges at him. The Hulk grabs the xenomorph by its throat only to get briefly incapacitated by the creature's acidic blood before killing it. Eventually, Carol, Miles, and Wayland arrive at the lab and they find Valeria lying dead. By this time, the egg Valeria had brought back with her had also hatched, and to everyone's horror, it ends up latching onto the face of Miles. 
Carol lets out a shriek and tries to get the face hugger off Miles, but deep down, she also knows that there is nothing one can do to save him now. With Waylon suggesting to Carol and the Hulk that they burn the Miles body immediately, the unexpected happens. Or should we Hickman at his best happens? The symbiote in Morales takes control of the facehugger, stating that while it does not like its current body, it will manage for the time being. Of course, everyone is flabbergasted by the epic turn of events, and in Waylon's own words, Parasite co-ops Parasite. Symbiote seemingly trumps Xenomorph. Carol helps Miles get up and asks him if he is doing all right. Before Miles can properly answer her, Symbiote's controlled facehugger jumps onto his very chest, absorbs into his suit and says that they are fine. Miles looks at his suit in disbelief and states that the only thing that will help him be able to sleep at night is to be able to get the hell off the planet. Marvelous verdict. Well, with this, we finally come to the exciting end of our video. If you ask us, we firmly believe that the symbiote will play a rather significant role in stopping the xenomorph threat. So, what are your thoughts on the first issue of Aliens vs. Avengers? Do you think we will have more Avengers making their appearances in the second issue? If you do, who do you think they will be? We would love to hear your thoughts in the comment section down below. Also, are you psyched up about the second issue? We know, we are, and we just can't wait. Now if you enjoy this video, you know what to do. Uh, please do leave a thumbs up and stay tuned with us, as we promise to come back with more exciting content. Till then, goodbye, and thanks for watching. Have a nice one.